A young human woman must fight to save her lover, a high lord among the fairy. In A Court of Thorns and Roses, that's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello everyone, and welcome. Thomas here, your host as always. Thank you for joining me. Sarah J. Moss is probably the writer most dominating the young adult bestseller lists these days, but it's interesting what a fraught relationship her fans seem to have with her. It seems like all her most devoted readers gripe about her, sometimes savagely. Now, not that I mind. <laughs> I find it really healthy to be conflicted towards the things you love. After all, it builds critical skills. Now, considering how low my expectations of A Court of Thorns and Roses had been driven, uh, by the time I found myself no longer able to avoid reading it, the most pleasant surprise to me was how much I didn't actually hate it. I mean, sure, it has quite a few flaws, and I can't, in all honesty, call it an artistic success, but I've read, God help me, some very popular YA that is much, much worse. Still, I know that sounds like damning with faint praise, because it is. For anyone who's been living under a rock for the last couple of years, A Court of Thorns and Roses begins a high fantasy series in which each novel takes, as inspiration, some legend or myth or fairy tale. It's uh, pretty much the same approach Marissa Meyer took to her Lunar Chronicles. Akutar, as it has been abbreviated by everyone, is billed as a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but much of the novel, especially its second half, owes far more to the Scottish ballad of Tam Lin, about a young mortal woman who must rescue her fairy lover held captive by the Fairy Queen, which she achieves by literally Wonder Womaning him off the back of a running horse. Good stuff. Also, did you know a while back there was a modern day Tamlin movie featuring a young Ian McShane as Tamlin? Well, now you do. You're welcome. Anyway, back to Akatar. Feyre is a young human woman whose family has fallen from aristocratic grace due to her father's debts. Now living destitute in a cabin in the woods, Feyre has taken up hunting and tracking as she's the only one of her spoiled siblings willing to do something to keep them all alive. Though, in her heart, all she wants to do is paint. One day she spots a wolf about to pounce on a deer she's been stalking and kills the wolf instead. Uh-oh, trouble. Turns out, the wolf was a fairy in disguise, and by killing him, Feyre has violated the terms of an ancient treaty between the Fae and the humans who were once enslaved by them, and who waged war for their freedom. That night, another fairy comes to claim her as prisoner, taking Feyre to spend the rest of her days living in Prithian, the Fae lands separated from the mortal lands by a magical wall. Her captor is Tamlin. <laughs> Moss is not exactly making the reference subtle there. One of the High Fae, and the ruler of the Spring Court, one of seven courts into which Prithian is divided. Now, if you know how fantasy series typically work when they number things in this way, I'm guessing this means we'll be getting a seven-book series. Anyway, Tamlin allows Feyre a surprising amount of freedom in his manner. Naturally, she's wary about this, but soon begins to settle in. And here is where a lot of inconsistencies in Feyre's character development come into play. She's supposedly developed mad hunting and tracking skills, and we see her using these on occasion, but we just as often see her being impulsive, ignoring sensible warnings, falling for obvious traps, and allowing herself to be snuck up on, as the story requires. Then there's Tamlin himself, a romantic hero who's so blandly perfect in every way that Moss feels no need to give him a personality, saving all of that development for Lucienne, Tamlin's emissary and beta male sidekick, and Rizand of the Sinister Night Court. Now, it's dead obvious that the genre formula Moss is sticking with here will require Feyre to discover her true love for Tamlin, which makes the fact that the book spends so much time shilly-shallying around to get to it much more of an exercise in tedium than anything like romantic or sexual tension. Sexual tension, after all, is rooted in will they or won't they? So let's be honest, in a situation where you know they won't isn't an option, well, 
200 plus pages waiting around for our star-crossed couple to bang is a bit much to ask of any but the most puritanical readers. Come on, get this party started! But to be fair, Moss has reasons for all of this, and they involve setting up an elaborate backstory involving a war, a curse, multiple betrayals, and an inevitable plot twist that will require us to question most of what we thought we knew about our hero. Which brings me to the next big frustration I had with Akatar that it's a book constantly reminding me of the better book I'd rather be reading. Wait, so we had a massive humans versus faith throwdown? We had an arch-villainess going rogue and laying a curse upon all the fey courts? And I have to hear about all this awesome spectacle in backstory dialogue exposition, while the actual narrative thinks I need to be most invested in this boring-ass romance? Sarah, you wrote the wrong book. I will give Moss credit where it's due, however. In the final hundred or so pages, she stops pulling her punches and gives us action galore as we are introduced to Amarantha, the aforementioned arch-villainess. Now, emphasis on the arch, to be sure. She's way over the top. But that just makes her interesting, set against all the other underwritten characters. So, we're treated to a series of trials that are violent and gory, and at last it's all kind of fun, though of course these scenes require Feyre, who has never before displayed much in the way of fighting prowess, to level up to legendary all at once. So, Akatar is a book that's all over the place, at times dull, at others overwrought. But credit Moss, with knowing which of her fans' buttons to push, and when to push them, and how hard. It's a C-list trash novel given an A-list presentation, and you'll most likely hate it, or hate yourself for loving it. And if the old saying is true that every rose has its thorn, well, with characters like the ones in this book, it might be more fitting to say, every thorn has its pricks. And that is all I got for this episode of SFF 180, everybody. Thank you once again for joining me. I very much appreciate it. Remember, the most important thing, these are reviews. You're not always going to agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you have not already done so, that's how SFF 180 grows as a channel. You can also support the channel at its Tee Public store and at my Patreon where recruits into Wink's army for $2 a month get to watch all my videos a day early. I want to thank all of those people for their extra support. I want to thank all of you just for being wonderful viewers. And until I see all you awesome people next time, happy reading.